Hey everybody, JB here for Cats and TV. Today it is a huge honor for me. I am really excited about this interview. Today I'm talking with James Strain, James Strain from the band Rascal Reporters. Welcome, James. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. I got to tell you, I have been listening to this album, the new Rascal Reporters album, The Strange Case of Steve, for the past week, week and a half since it arrived. And I tell you, it's just it just hasn't left the CD player until just now. It's fantastic, just complex, you know, and yet tuneful music. It doesn't, you know, kind of overload you with the... Uh, the crazy thorny dissonance or anything. It's very easy to listen to, and yet it, it's got a sophistication to it that just really, it, it makes it go down smooth. So my hat's off to you on that. I want to oh, talk a little so bit about, for Rascal Reporters, you know, this is a band that uh, I'm kind of kicking myself because until just recently, until just a few months ago when I started, the hype machine started building up on the pre-release for this album, this is something I was not aware of at all and uh mm. like i said could you give us a little bit of the history of the band yeah i'd love to so i mean like that's a big part of the reporters is that it's kind of what part of what draw draw me to them was the fact that they've been going for so long making all this music and they're just so under the radar at no point did they seem to get that you know that breakthrough or anything where they got that big push and it's like waiting to discover them is like the big barrier between people loving rascal reporters i feel is like just finding out and hearing them so like the group started i think it was like early 70s uh steve gore was recording stuff at home on his reel-to-reel -reel tape machine like noisy um experimental like sound recording sound collage kind of stuff recording stuff from the radio and that kind of thing mm -hmm. got into a group then with some friends in high school and formed a group that they called Pigling Bland, named after a soft machine tune. The soft and that machine was more, tune, right, right? Yeah, yeah. And that was more of a kind of like, that was very much kind of Canterbury-esque, you know, live performance. They played together, rehearsed as a group and that kind of thing. And Steve Kretzmer and Steve Gore were the two kind of powerhouses of composition in the group. And there was um, Rick Barinholtz as well on bass playing with them. After a while, the group kind of whittled down to just Steve Gore and Steve Kretzmer recording music at home and in Steve Gore's kind of like home recording setup and that kind of thing and kind of laboring over tunes in a kind of recording based way rather than thinking about live performance just how, what can we do with tape laying stuff down layering stuff up you know building soundscapes and, and this kind of stuff just in recording and that was like the early 70s throughout the 70s they kind of structured a lot of um real complex music but wasn't really releasing anything just kind of experimenting with it and it wasn't until like 1980 they put out the first release which was a cassette release on a label called u rock um eu or o c k and um they did two cassette releases with them at the start of 1980 that was freaks obscure and we're god and that was their kind of first public release was that and after that, they went on to make uh, Riding on a Bummer in 1984, and that was pressed to vinyl. And that was like a self-pressing, and that was kind of the big, the first big break. They started sending stuff out to collaborators. They'd, they'd post the actual reel-to-reel -reel tapes using media mail to the mm -hmm. collaborators. They would record on the tape and post it back to them. And so they got, I think they, they got Tim Hodgkinson, they got Fred Frith, and they got Dave Newhouse involved on that record. And that, like, opened it up to a lot of people who might have only heard of Fred Frith or, you know, one of the other groups, the Muffins and that kind of thing. And right. they kind of got involved in that way. And that's kind of how they got their name out a little bit with, like, mail order services and that kind of thing. I think they had, like, Wayside Distributing or uh, I'm not sure if it was Wayside at the time or whatever it was called. But there was some distribution happening there and kind of getting it pushed out a little bit. And right. that was the first kind of um, major step that they made. After that was happy accidents in 1988 which is that's the album that got me into rascal reporters that's the this one here on the t-shirt and if um, i may ask you so where did you hear that how did how did it come across your ears was it a radio station that played it or it's, you saw it in the catalog how did you first hear the band so it was 2018 or 2017 maybe for me mm -hmm. i was um exploring progarchives.com Oh. which is uh, a website for, yeah, it catalogs different prog subgenres, 
people can rate them and review stuff. And I was just getting into, I was kind of getting a bit uh, tired of what I would call like kind of classic or standard prog rock at the time. You know, when you first discover prog, it's like this, you know, your mind is blowing. It's like all this stuff that you didn't think you could do in music, it's all happening and things are changing and evolving and all this. But then after a while, if you're keeping listening to what, I guess, symphonic prog and that kind of thing, Right. You start to see that there's a bit of a framework to that now and like a lot of new music coming out and that it kind of follows a, a template when originally you get into it because there's like not a template or whatever. So I started getting into like the avant-garde and rocking opposition stuff, wanted to get a bit deeper into it and get my mind blown again. And I was like just so searching the, uh, the subgenres page on Prague Archives. And it was like listed down at the bottom of the page in this section for like underrated and unknown or something. And nice. I saw the artwork for Happy Accidents and I was like, that looks cool. That's a different kind of artwork for a prog album. It's almost a bit, you know, Art Nouveau or something. It's not really like this kind of fantastical, just some alien landscape or something, which I do love as well. But, you know, it caught my eye. I checked out the like credits on it and I saw there was like Dave Kerman from 5UUs who I just just discovered recently at the time and I was falling in love with. There was like Guy Seagars from Universe Zero and all that. There was a good few names on there that I was like, okay, I should check this out. And as soon as I put it on, it just, yeah, it totally blew my mind because it starts off with this section that I would like, I would think of almost like an intro for a game show or something. You can almost hear a narrator on it being, I'm welcome, your host, blah, blah, blah. And like hear the audience applauding over it. And I was like, okay, this is a different way to open a prog album. Right. Then that section stops and it's like a solo flute doing this atonal thing. And then it goes like hard avant, piano stabs and syncopation. I'm just like, okay, this is, this is something else like. And that was my introduction to Rascal Report, just having my mind blown through the length of that album. Just like there's this... Like, as you said, there's like this this other thing to Rascal Reporter's music where it's like, it's definitely out there. It's definitely avant-garde, but there's this joyful, tuneful nature to it. Nice. Playful. Nice. Like, it's, it's, in, it's like things do get quite complicated and things do like harmoniously interesting and, you know, atonal to an extent at times. But it's like, instead of it being like one element is moving this way and these other elements are moving this other way and there's this dissonant clash, which is kind of what a lot of avant-garde music is built on, this clash of sounds and stuff. But with Rascal Reporters, it's like the music, when it moved from one thing to the other, everything moved at the same time. So it's like you might have one section that's like in one key and the next chord might be a totally different key, but everything moves with that. And so every section by itself still sounds really tuneful and harmonious. It's not harsh. You can follow it easily because everything leads into each other in an unexpected but um, understandable way. Like when it moves into the next section, it's like, oh, I get that. That makes sense that it would go there. I didn't expect it, but it did. Right. And yeah, it's that like playful energy to it that really drew me into it. It didn't it was not too self-serious and it, it, it doesn't mind going from just one section that's totally one way and then just stopping in the middle of a bar and then like, okay, let's do something totally different now. And it's almost like ADHD prog music, <laughs> like for, I don't know. Yeah, it's great stuff. Like I, I just got sucked into it from there. So how did it, how did it come that, you know, as a fan, you eventually end up becoming a member of the band, end up collaborating? <laughs> how, how did that happen? No, oh, that was totally, totally crazy for me. It was... um I basically got in, so when I was discovering Rascal Reporters, I was trying to find more music from them. It didn't seem like there was enough music for me by them out there. I was like right. trying to hear in all the albums, but then like I would be googling stuff and researching stuff, and I would see reference to like this other album that you can't get anywhere, or all these other tracks that were played on a radio show one time, but you can't get them anywhere. And it's like it seemed like if you could scratch beneath the surface and break through, there was like this wealth of material there to explore, but it wasn't publicly available. Mm -hmm. So I got in touch with, um, I basically started trying to weasel my way into the, into someone's ear in the group, you know, and I got in touch with, I think it was Bill Andrews, friend of uh, Steve Kretschmer and Steve Gore. He was like best man at both of their weddings and that kind of thing. And he's kind of been like in a bit of a managerial role throughout the band's history and that kind of thing, helping right. out here and there. And was, was particularly close with Steve Gore and all that in terms of managing the archive over the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, got talking to him, trying to get more music from him, basically. Can I hear more stuff? What's your favorite thing? Can I hear it? You know, this kind of stuff. And 
eventually came to a deal. This is an interesting kind of way to get in there, but um, Steve Kretzmer was trying to record more music for this new album he was working on, eventually ended up becoming Strange Case of Steve. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a few tracks recorded. All he had was a Casio keyboard that didn't have any velocity sensitivity to it. Right. So if he was playing something soft, you know, it would come out loud. There wasn't that dynamic to the keyboard. It wasn't great for recording versatile music like that. And right. so he was working with this cheap Casio keyboard. And I was saying, Look, I'll buy you a new MIDI keyboard with touch sensitivity. I'll get it shipped to your house. I'll get it from Toman direct, straight, directly to you or whatever. Mm -hmm. And in exchange, you give me a copy of the archives, the entire Rascal Reporter archives. And so we did this trade and I get the hard drive from Bill in the post. I'm exploring the archive, just enjoying the music, just seeing this, like it's all the reel to reel. These are all digitized by uh, Brian Donahoe over mm -hmm. the last 10, 15 years. He got Steve Gore's entire reel to reel collection, DAT tapes, cassette tapes, CDs, everything, digitized the whole thing, spent years transferring all the stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was exploring this and finding little bits and pieces and I was, so I come from like a hip hop and jazz kind of background rather mm -hmm. than a prog background really in terms of making music. Sure. And my proposition was I will make a remix album of mm -hmm. like sampling Rascal Reporter's music, turning it into hip hop beats, maybe getting some raps on it and make something like that. Mm -hmm. And throughout like making some of these tracks, I started finding like unfinished tunes like keyboard parts that just felt like, oh, what would this sound like if I put a drum beat on it? Like I actually just played some drums on it and this kind of thing. Right. And I just started messing around with that and sending a few little ideas over to Stephen. Um, here's like this little keyboard piece that you did at some point, definitely unfinished. I put some bits on it. Here's what it sounds like. Pretty fun, pretty cool. And um, it went from that basically to Stephen inviting me to join the band and we did the Redux volume one as the first thing that I was involved in. And mm -hmm. when I initially joined the band, I thought that was going to be the capacity like Stephen, the composer, mm -hmm. and me just kind of like a helping hand in terms of drums, bass, the other instrumentation, that kind of thing. I'd right. finish songs and that I would kind of dress them up and produce them and that kind of thing. But um, after we did the Redux volume, and that went well. That was kind of like a baptism by fire of sorts, learning how to create Rascal Reporter's music. Because right. the tracks that we were doing on that were like some of the the most complicated stuff that they couldn't finish over the years. Tracks like Hubert Greenery Peck, Egg right. Soup, Moments. Those were tracks that are like, you know, Stephen, both Steve's considered them to be like Steve Kretzmer's like masterpieces. Right. And just they didn't, ever get finished because they were too complicated to complete by having to do it in the old school way of recording it directly to tape having to do a million takes wearing down the tape till it sounds like crap you know like it, it just it wasn't feasible with that kind of method so um doing that really kind of trained me how to create rascal reporters type drums rascal reporters type bass lines things that i felt fed fit in naturally and they fed into the music but they were they were kind of like inspired by the reporter's history, but obviously coming with my own ear into it because sure, sure. I'm like the two Steves. I'm not a trained like um, musician in terms of I can't like uh, hear something and break down or work on something and transcribe it and kind of break down. OK, well, what kind of harmonies are going on here that makes it like it is? It's really just kind of like a vibe thing. I kind of understand it in my own way and transmute that into whatever I create for it. So like kind of creating a new kind of sound between the oldest unfinished Rascal Reporters recordings and the newest kind of side of it, which is me coming into the group. And that kind of feel laid the groundwork then for when Stephen asked me to actually compose half of Strange Case of Steve alongside him. And that was like a whole new challenge then in terms of like, OK, well, now how do I write a Rascal Reporter song from scratch? I know how to play to one right. and I know some of the things now, but how am I going to be the one to originate where song comes from? So I was starting to play around then with like looking in the archives for different ideas, like how might the guys start a song when they were starting a song? What do they start with? Do they start with the keys? Do they start with a, a rhythm? Do they, you know, trying to just, just decipher different ideas that they would have had in terms of how they would have written songs and taking keys from that and implementing them in my own way. So like a big part of it is like, 
I heard a recording in the archives of Steve Gore and Steve Kretzmer back during the, uh, the Riding on a Bummer sessions mm -hmm. discussing how they were kind of getting frustrated. I think Steve Gore mainly about not being able to read and write music and how it felt like it was holding them back from writing some of the more complex music they wanted to write, long repeating drawn out phrases and stuff like this that are like, they're really long, but they repeat the exact same way, same way at different points. And like, how do they remember it? And all this kind of stuff, they must be writing it and just kind of getting frustrated that they couldn't do that. And then Steve Kretzmer talking about how he um, writes as like an improvisational collector, I think is the way he said. He would sit down, improvise, find bits that he likes, collect them, put them together and make something like that. And so right. for a lot of tracks, like that's kind of how I try to approach it. Then it's like, I'll sit down at the keys, I'll improvise stuff, but like in less of a, I'm less of a, a practiced keyboard player than, than Steve Kretzmer would be. I'd be more of a producer kind of a sequencer. Um, I'm much better at bass and guitar and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I would record stuff and then like edit it down. So I would record maybe 10 minutes of improvisation, then edit that down to like a two or three minute piece, maybe do that a few times. And then I have a five minute song that like keeps moving, the bits move into each other because they flowed into each other in the improvisation, but I'm chopping out the bad bits or, you know, I'm cleaning it up that way. And then once I have a bed there, I know how to dress that in right. a Rascal Reporter's way, like with the Redux stuff. I felt practice because of that. Okay, I do want to pick up on one of the things that you just mentioned there. Uh, you know, I was kind of struck, again, by the complexity and the sophistication of the music, and you did mention that uh, neither of the Stevens... Uh, Red music and nor yourself is that correct? I mean, you that's it, it's just it's incredible, you know. I mean, of course, there are precedents for this, you know. Uh, classical Indian music, of course, is, is mm. taught by ear and learned by rote, so to speak. Uh, but just you know, a, a lot of the music touches at times on contemporary composition or contemporary classical music, uh, mm -hmm. one might say, you know. Uh, at times, it, it does get some of that kind of bracing, thorny dissonance, as we talked about, but mm. not all of the times. So I, I find that fascinating. Is is that something that you listen to yourself? Do you listen to any of that con contemporary classical kind of stuff? Or you said you come from more of a hip-hop kind of thing. Uh, so mm. what, what are your listening uh, kind of habits? What do you listen to when you're not making your own music? So I think like for both myself and the Steves, mm -hmm. a lot of the kind of classic, modern classical kind of approach comes through Zappa. Right. So it would be like the Uncle Meat style Zappa, you know, the the, the real um, through composed type Zappa, the, the mm -hmm. complex kind of stuff on that level. So that would be kind of where I get my kind of side of it from, at least. Um, and I know that the two Steves were big fans of Uncle Meat back in the day. And they kind of, they both bonded over that in high school. I think that's like the, the story that's told is they, they met in the schoolyard one day. One of them had a copy of Uncle Meat on them for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Steve comes over and it's like, is that fucking Uncle Meat? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> right. And um, so, uh, yeah, like, and that as well as just other Avant Prague, um, some stuff like and Bob Drake did an album kind of down those lines a few years back. Um it's not the Gardens of Beastly Manor, it might be that one, I'm not sure, but um, it's very kind of through composed, just winding melodies with accompaniment and that kind of thing. And I got really just, there's something about hearing the work in the music that I like, you know, where you can hear that every note I was thought about, it, it never kind of rests on its laurels. And that kind of really, that really speaks to me for whatever reason. But generally, um, my kind of intro into that kind of side of stuff would have been I, through, I suppose, Canterbury on the side of like national health. Right. The National Health uh, self-titled debut album is like really one of the prog albums that really grabbed me. And it took me years to realize it was part of this other style of prog. You know, right. I just thought this is just some random prog album that just really ticked those boxes. And it took me a good while to figure out it, there was this Canterbury scene thing that was this other kind of sound. And it kind of meshes with the avant prog a little bit as well. And there's a bit of crossover there. Sure. Um, aside from that, it's like, yeah, it will be still hip hop. I'm listening to a lot of mm -hmm. uh, alternative rock of certain types. Like I'm re I was really into my first big 
rock band that I was into outside of like the young kids stuff I was really into Linkin Park back in the day and that kind of thing but right. like Beastie Boys would have got me into a lot of styles of music because they're so versatile sure, they would have done sure. hip hop but they did the funk stuff they did the rock stuff you right. know they did a whole manner of stuff there's some bossa nova kind of stuff as well and then there was like yeah, Pixies, um, really kind of punky, indie, alternative, but also quite proggy as well, particularly the last album, Trompe Le Monde, sure. before the breakup, that I got really into. And then the Frank Black solo stuff as well, I really got into the kind of the complex nature of that. It was like, it's kind of cardiac -y in a way, because right, it's right. like, has that hard-edged, heavy, kind of punky, rocky kind of thing, but also the stoppy, starty thing. And yeah, I always thought there was this like... Um, what would you call it? This, uh, I don't know, synergy between Frank Black and, and Cardiac. So when I heard Cardiac, I was like, oh my God, this is like Frank Black multiplied by Frank Black multiplied by Frank Black, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, yeah, that, that would be kind of the, the, oh yeah, well, there is a lot of world music recently I've been getting into as well. Um, I've been into a lot of Indian classical, but particularly like Anushka Shankar. Um, right. because I like how she fuses it with other styles of music. Mm -hmm. And I really like hearing world music styles fused with other more contemporary Western styles so I can really hear what makes it different in contrast. Right. Like uh, Arabic pop music has sure. a lot of like the same conventions as Western pop music in terms of the production, but mm -hmm. the scales and the melodies and the rhythms, you know, there's microtonal scales in the melodies they're singing and the rhythms have these different subdivisions that we don't use or there's just different types of swing. And it's like, it really puts into sharp contrast the, uh, what makes that music the way that it is, you know, what makes it special and different compared to what we're so used to here and here. And so I've been messing around with like, you'll hear some sitar on the album. Mm -hmm. You hear some gamelan. Um, I got right, a little yes. gangsta from gamelan on there. And um, you're getting really into that. But like, I mean, that's the kind of thing where like, if you want to make gamelan music by yourself, you don't really make gamelan music by yourself. You need like a bunch of people. You need a whole orchestra of, of equipment as well. Like it's, but like introducing little bits of that here and there is um, very fun for me, like Oud as well from Arabic music and Saz from Turkish music and that kind of thing. I'm looking into a lot of that kind of stuff as well recently. Right. Fantastic. I do want to talk about the new album. Uh, one of the things mm. that I did want to talk about, you mentioned uh, one of the first things that attracted you once you saw uh, some of the other albums listed online was the cover art. Now, mm -hmm. I, I, I noticed that this the artist who did this cover, I believe, did maybe one or two of the previous covers or a number of the previous covers. Who is this artist? It's uh, Dario D'Alessandro. He is a painter and a um, musician from the band Homunculus Res which mm -hmm. you may know as well. Uh -huh. um, he's, uh, he did the cover for Redux Volume 2 as right. well, right. which is another kind of painted scene. It's, uh, it was like, it's supposed to be kind of like a sci-fi movie poster from yesteryear kind of thing. Right. And um, he also contributes like uh, rhythm guitar and synth and right. like other playing, music right. performance parts on Redux and on the new album as well. So he's a really great close collaborator. I also did the mix and master for the last homunculus res album oh did you? and Fantastic. played oud on one of the tracks as well right an amazing musician amazing artist like having having like that album art on that is just i mean we just got some amazing comments regarding just the album art alone like and it's great to create such a strong visual impression like that that was right. like an idea that was like thrown around between Stephen and Dario, they kind of conceptualize it. And then uh, Dario just came back with this painting and it's like, oh, shit, geez, just get that quality of art back is just so, so amazing. Like, like this is going to be on our album. Great. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> okay. So again, on this one, um, you know, uh, it seems to be doing rather well. As I understand it, the physical is sold out uh, from cuneiform, right? Cuneiform, cuneiform. Mm -hmm. I'm always unclear on how to pronounce that. Uh, but Steve Feigenbaum doesn't have any more physical copies. This copy, I believe, I actually ordered from you uh, over there in mm -hmm. Ireland. It, it took a while to get here, but it was well, well worth the wait, I'm telling you. So uh, has it been, it seems to be gathering a little bit of press out there. People are responding to it. Yeah, we're getting a little bit of momentum with it. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing to see some of the reviews that have come out about it. Like, I mean... Any of the actual reviews that we've seen have all been like overwhelmingly positive. There's right. not been like I've not seen a negative review of it anywhere. The um, it is it's it's really kind of surreal 
for me because like I'm kind of coming in with a bit of imposter syndrome like how am I going to step into this band and like right. how is this going to be received amongst you know it's like that classic thing of new member joins long running prog band right. writing songs it's just there's something changed something died something's not right anymore the band smells funny that kind of thing but um, in this case everyone's really like welcomed my input into the group ever since redux people haven't really questioned it they've just been like okay this is this is good i like this album i've never really gotten any crap for it so i'm 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 very happy with how the album's been perceived like especially since this time it's music that i've composed alongside steve as well it's not just um compositions from the the two steves it's it's some compositions from myself as well and for me this is my first outing as a prog musician i've put out some jazz fusion stuff before i put out hip-hop stuff electronic stuff but i've never put out anything prog i barely even recorded anything prog before reporters mm -hmm. and i'm just so like relieved that it's been accepted and i can see a bit of a for a while it's if it, it felt like is this just going to be kind of an archival thing are we going to get the the new album done is it going to be just redoing old stuff but now it feels like oh it really is a new chapter now Mm -hmm. and people are okay with this new reporters and um it's it's actually getting a bit of traction which is it's almost surreal for a band like reporters we're getting people like saying like like yourself is it's like people just being like where have they been all my life like right. i've been right. i'm literally like live the town over from you how come i never heard of you oh, and this kind of stuff like and it's it, 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 it's it's great that it's getting a bit of push now to get to people's ears because like i was saying earlier i think like a big part of the issue why the band isn't bigger is just people haven't heard us like i think if i think if prog fans find the group they'll find a lot to love there and like if even if it's not going to be one album there's definitely going to be an album there that has a lot of stuff you're going to love because it ticks so many boxes and covers so much ground there is stuff like the older some of the older stuff where it is very just like song based music it is just like this is just a really lovely well-written song and right. then the next track is like a 15 minute convoluted undulating shapeshifter you know and uh, it's for something there's a little bit of something for everyone <laughs> fantastic. well all the accolades you're getting are well deserved i'm telling you it's a fantastic piece of work and your writing fits so well amongst you know the writing that has the precedents that have been set by the two Stevens over the years. I'm telling you, it's just amazing oh, stuff. And I'm really, really glad that I found this music and had an opportunity to speak with you today. Oh, thank you so much. Look, it's, it's, it's a dream come true for me. I never thought I'd be in a position like this. And it's like, it's still like an underground thing, but it feels like I'm creating music that really fulfills me. And I feel like it, it adds something to reporters as well. And that's, that's a crazy spot to be in. Like, so I'm just still pinching myself when I think about it. Okay. Wonderful. Today we have been speaking once again with James strain from rascal reporters, the new album, of course, the strange case of Steve available, uh, through the cuneiform Bandcamp page website, so forth as a download. Um, are there, do you have any physical copies left James? Maybe a couple. I have two copies, and they're both staying with me. <laughs> okay. So, at this point, not available on physical unless you find it used, but please do check it out for a download. James Strain, thank you so much. Rascal Reporters, check it out. To find out more about Rascal Reporters, including the contributions of James Strain, please visit their official website and check out the description below this video. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe to CatSynth TV. You are watching CatSynth TV.